All right, I'm calling the uh, Spokane City Council study session to order for today, and we are going to first go into an executive session and then do a public safety budget presentation. Um, we are, for if you're watching, we are going to have a, a formal special legislative session at 12.30, and we can't start it any earlier than that, so we'll, we may have a little bit of a break between the two. Uh, but first, we're going to go into executive session uh, for initially for 15 minutes to discuss real estate and potential litigation. And we'll come back out. We don't plan on taking any action uh, for the study session afterwards. And if we're not done in 15 minutes, we'll extend that. So if we can adjourn. And we've got several lawyers from City Legal and Tim Fisher. I think that's it from outside of council.
City Council is extending executive session until 11.30 a.m. We do have additional study session topics when they return.
City Council is extending executive session an additional five minutes until 11.35 a.m.
get nice and warm. All right, I'll gather us back into regular study session. We're going to have a presentation on 2023 budget public safety staffing. And I believe Tanya Wallace is going to lead us off. Okay, I just have a few brief things to get you started. And then the chiefs are really going to take over and talk to you a bit about their 23 operational plan for staffing. Let's see, Hannah Lee, do you have that? The folder's open on there. Yes. Um, the purpose of what I'm going to present to you is to give you context, and we did pass information out because there are numbers involved that I'm not going to present up here because there's just too many. They can't quite fit very well. Um, so we're, we've given you hard copies of those. So I'm just going to quickly give you some of the highlights for fire and police and then again turn it over to the chiefs to talk in more detail. Um, for fire, just to give you some context of what we've done, because you will see that the numbers are probably going to look a little differently than they have in the past, and for very good reason. Um, so labor agreement impacts are, have been included um, as to what we know about those labor agreements. So you can have confidence that those are in there. 30 additional firefighters are included um, in the fire personnel costs. And that is out of that labor agreement that has been negotiated. And a staffing study is in progress. Would, uh, we do would you say additional, those aren't additional positions. Those are just people actually filling the positions, right? Those or are, are actual new positions. In the budget. New in position. the budget, yes. The budget focuses largely on positions and not incumbents in the positions. Although that, the incumbents in the position is how we build the, the budget. But those are the 30 additional firefighters that need to be brought on board in preparation for 2024 when the debit days go away in accordance with the labor agreement. So this is planning for that impact. Um, there are two recruit academies that are planned in that operational uh, budget. Um, we have also adjusted for vacancies. So we worked with the fire department to look at their current vacancies and then also project out the timing of the academies. So we have discounted some of the budget and that is part of what, you're, what you might see in some of the details um, is adjusted for those vacancies. And then overtime budget. We did do some analysis on overtime and we've heard that quite loudly or, or urgently to get the budget right. So we looked at a few years previous to the budget, and you can see some of those numbers there, but tied a, a relationship between base wages relative to overtime. There's always going to be overtime. No matter what, there's always going to be overtime. But we looked at the pre-pandemic level of overtime actually paid relative to the base wages. Um, and then we took into account our current vacancy situation and the projected vacancy situation and the two recruit academies. And that is where we came up to that ratio, and that is what you're seeing budgeted there. Can Council I ask Member you a question? You? I, I don't want to interrupt you, but it, if you don't ask it, I'll forget it. So as I'm looking at fire personnel costs, and we're going back to 2019, and I think if you went back further, this we'd see some of the same thing. But we see the actual, and then we see the budgeted. So every year, fire is going over its budgeted overtime. So to me, I mean, significantly, to me that says we're not being realistic about what we're budgeting for overtime. Uh, you, you are correct. Um, part of the understanding that I have is that where we budget 100% up in the base wages, but we know we have vacancies, that was assumed to help cover the overage in overtime in that specific line item. Now, if you look at the 2023 numbers, you will see the highest amount of overtime budgeted in the years that you have in front of you. So we have, but we've also discounted base wages and we've discounted benefits to account for, for that. So we've tried to fix 
the budgeting to be more reflective of what we believe is actually what we'd actually see. Because if you look at the budget on base wages, you'll see that it tends to be higher while the actuals are a little less, and that's because of vacancies. So we've attempted to correct that. I, it's just, I, I'm guessing it's gonna go over that 13. That's... Okay. Um, also there, and, and like I, we, we put there, managed target based on pre-pandemic. So even though what you see in front of you is 2019, we actually looked at also 18 and 17, so that we could say, yeah, it's generally in this range. What we're budgeting for in 23 is actually a higher range than even the pre-pandemic. But we think that's reasonable given the, the, the vacancies that we currently have and the timing of, of the um, academies. Now for police personnel costs, also the labor agreement impacts are included in there. Um, we've also adjusted for vacancies on the current status and then for overtime, we did a very similar analysis. Um, police has a, a slightly different situation of what's happening with their overtime and what the key drivers are. And if you look at the details that are in front of you, you will see like particularly in 22 right now, year to date, we're, we're trending higher. And a lot of that, I'm not gonna, I'm sure they can correct me, seems to be related to the homelessness impacts and what are going on around that. So there are different drivers for their overtime but we've applied the same kind of logic analysis uh, for them as well. So I just wanted to give you a little context before they start presenting. And as always, if you'd like to go into the more details, um, happy to meet with you to review that. Tony, I have a quick question. Yes. Um, I may miss it. The analysis that you came for the estimate of the budget, overtime budget, was that from the overtime study that was that was passed? Funding no, the that? overtime study for both fire and police is still underway. We're in the process of looking at comparable cities, um, but we expect that to be wrapping up very, very shortly. Like, so it, it doesn't have those recommendations in it yet because we haven't yeah. seen those recommendations. Any idea how shortly? Like very shortly, like next week shortly or Not January <laughs> shortly? <laughs> Probably closer towards the end of the year. Honestly, it does take a while when you put out for comparables and you're asking other uh, agencies for their information. You got to have to wait till they reply. And then I guess my follow up is when you're estimating the overtime ratios this year, I guess, can you pull up how much we missed the mark in the past few years? So we estimated overtime estimates when we budgeted but then we had to make adjustments by the end of the year, like we are this year. Can you give us kind of ballparking the last three years, how much we missed it by? Um, no, but those numbers are in front of you. It's right there. Oh, About it the is? budget versus the actual. Oh, okay, overtime. it is, okay. Yeah. Right. So if you want more details, we can certainly right. meet and I can, right. I can go through that with you. Okay, with that, I'll turn I, it just over. Just a quick oh, question. Yes. Yes, so sir. I'm looking at the police 22, I think there's an SBO that we've been given for $2.5 million of mm -hmm. overtime. It seems like that's really going to change that 13%. That 13%. By the time we get to the end of the year. Yes, and you'll also it would also be the same for fire because fires also ask for an SBO to cover that, so. So could you not, not in real time, but could you give us uh, maybe, I don't know if it would be a different sheet from this, but just say projected year end on police and fire on that, that includes those two SBOs? Yes, we can get that for you. Okay, okay. thanks. Looks like I lost a toss up, so you have to <laughs> suffer through me first. Um, and Hannah Lee, let me know if I'm doing this right, if there's anything that I need to do to present here that's different than what I'm doing. 
You've all done right. all you need to do. All right. I love to hear it. So uh, now, now is time for us to really talk about the details because the, I've met with the majority of the council individually, administration. Uh, the resounding message back to us is what are you going to do about controlling overtime? I mentioned in public safety the uh, academies and how we intend to increase our staffing to address the problem, but there is a lot more going on in the background that I wanted to share. For uh, major areas, the collective bargaining uh, agreement that you signed, areas in the collective bargaining agreement that address overtime, uh, rebound, our hiring plan, and a general uh, innovation that came from the inside of the fire department to provide decision makers with better SA or situational awareness. First off, uh, a huge thanks to um, Chief Williams and to Local 29, our primary bargaining unit in the fire department. It's been a long road. They, uh, they worked uh, relentlessly when we were able to following the pandemic to get to a place, uh, an agreement that they brought to you for approval. There are every, uh, every contract has challenges that we go after year after year after year after year to try to streamline and save costs. And there was an opportunity with this granted by the reduction of debit days or actually the elimination of debit days that opened up the door. One is to eliminate the opportunity for members to take vacation on trade days, which was um, identified very early before we ever had a consultant looking at our overtime and by the operations chief and the assistant chief and many of the folks in the field, uh, it, was, uh, it was a way in to uh, add to um, time and a half pay when you were actually supposed to be off. So we removed that. Uh, additionally, we did the same thing for uh, debit days and having people working back on days that they had taken off previously, which was a practice that was allowed under the previous CBA and um, was pretty, uh, by uh, a number of people, exploited. And uh, unfortunately, it was an opportunity within the contract that was what, what they were doing was allowed. So we bargained that out. And then also, uh, on a daily basis, we would see captains, which may make twice as much as a firefighter, but a vacancy coming up, which would be a firefighter vacancy, the previous contract allowed the captain to work in place of that firefighter. So times we're paying twice as much to fill a vacancy uh, because of the rules that were in the collective bargaining agreement. Again, uh, nobody was necessarily um, doing anything wrong. They were following the rules, but unfortunately it put us in a place where it exacerbated our overtime problem. And then lastly, um, we adopted an FLSA work week to where previously, before the contract, any time that a firefighter would be working would be counted as overtime and paid a time and a half. Now they have to fulfill 168 day, I believe, 68 day uh, trigger before they would start accumulating overtime. So if someone would have a vacation day or someone would have a sick day, uh, they could work over uh, what would be considered in an overtime um, position previously, but until they got to 168 days, that's straight pay. Again, huge wins for the city. That was a collaborative process with Local 29. Three more I'll just mention. Uh, we reduced the uh, length of the probationary period to get deputy fire marshals on the street faster, which was a win for us and reduced overtime as well as allowing probationary employees to trade. Currently, if a probationary employee has uh, like a vacation that, that they'd like to go to or um, a, a sick relative and they don't have sick time, they would have to, have to actually, I'm sorry, not sick time, but they would have to use sick time uh, or be forced to use sick time and, and that would cause overtime. Now they have the ability to trade with their peers, which is uh, a big win for us as well. That was a legacy, uh, that was a legacy rule that when we asked around, there was really, there was no explanation to why it was just, that's the way it's always been. So let's challenge that and make the improvements structurally so we can take the uh, benefit. And then one other uh, I consider pretty innovative uh, idea that the team came up with was to reduce sick leave usage by paying that out at the end of the year if it's unused for 50%. So not at 100%, but at 50%, they're able to actually be incentivized for not using sick time, and, and that results to 100 uh, 
uh, results in overtime. And unfortunately, in our situation, as you all know, with so many vacancies, every hour really matters. I mean, a year ago, we eliminated all of non-operational overtime. Anything that's not critical, we're not allowing overtime. So we've tried to do our best with the direction or the directive, mm -hmm. but when you don't have all these other rules that we were able to uh, negotiate in the contract, you don't, you don't have the structural change. And this isn't just a structural change for this year, this is a structural change for five years. So I'm pretty impressed with what they did. Again, uh, another aspect of, and if you have questions, stop me. Um, just feel free to jump in. Another area that you supported uh, was a labor management cooperative to create an agreement with Rebound, which gets people back to work faster. And that also reduces overtime. This was uh, presented back in public safety, but we're estimating around $440,000 two weeks ago of saved overtime based on looking at the same injuries and the same length away from the job. This, this program gets people either into surgery or into PT back to work sooner than a traditional um, situation where we're separated. When we don't have somebody calling and checking on those people, calling physicians, working within the workers' comp system to advocate for us getting that person back because 99.9% .9 of the time, they wanna get back. They're, they're athletes, so, so we need to treat them like athletes. They need to get the hardcore PT and surgery when it's necessitated and get them back on the street, and that's what Rebound's done for us. Lastly, this may be a duplicate slide for many of you, but in uh, 2022, this year, we've already graduated 17 new firefighters. We'll be graduating 21 new firefighters in a couple months, and then we've got two additional classes planned. Um, now, these two additional classes, based on some feedback, again, with our labor management partnership, uh, and, and, and Betsy and a number of you, actually, that contacted us, why do we have this EMT requirement? Uh, Many people identify the EMT requirement as a barrier to uh, even applying to, in the front door through civil service to take our test. Uh, again, it was one of those legacy things. Well, why, why not? Why are we doing this? Well, because it saves the city money. But at the same time, it's saving money because we don't have to provide EMT training. It's also creating a barrier of people that have other responsibilities, kids or live in different socioeconomic situations where they can't come in. and and actually take a 10 week or a 20 week class. This opens it up and the fire department's taking the responsibility of training these people with EMT so they're able to come in with a high school diploma, which uh, is pretty remarkable in my mind and again was uh, worked through with civil service and the local and has been advocated uh, by everybody here. And I think that is going to open up uh, our levels for increasing diversity and inclusiveness and, and help with the belonging in the department, which is something that we've struggled with because we're bringing so many new people on all the time. And uh, you've seen what our plan is and how fast we're hiring. You can imagine what it's like when people are in life and death situations. We rely a lot of time on knowing our partner or knowing our crew. We're inserting a lot of new people and there's gonna have to be a lot of learning and a lot of focus on developing trust and that competency that comes along with experience. So that is a hiring plan. The idea again is when you sign the collective agreement, bargaining agreement that limits debit days without the debit days to fill in the vacancies created by vacation and leave that requires FTE time and is going to require. Can you explain that? Because, and I'm not, uh, absolutely, I, don't, I yeah. don't recall us getting briefed on what that meant at sure. the time. So if you could just tell us what that means. So across the state, when, when we go, uh, when the teams sit down for bargaining, one of the primary areas that is bargained is, is working conditions. And, and one of those working conditions is hours of work. Um, several years ago in 1992, we had a three platoon system and they bargained a, a four platoon system to try to decrease that hours of work and still maintain an adequate number of FTEs to fill, uh, to fill vacancies. Back then we used to have something called a relief pool and the relief pool would be scheduled per shift and it would be a group of people that in the morning, depending on who was sick and what vacancies were present, we would fill in with relief. 
That was back at a 48-hour work week, I believe. And over time, it's gotten down to 46.15, and that's the way it's been for the last 15 years. This agreement, to be able to get the changes, the structural changes to dispatch, and to get the structural changes to the one, the slides that I presented formerly, um, we decreased the amount of hours per week to 42. 42 is where Seattle, Everett, and a number of other agencies are moving to as well. When you go to a 42-hour work week, we will not have debit days anymore. Debit days were designed to um, have a work back. So the employee works 46.15. At the end of the year, that turns out to be nine shifts that they owe back to the city. We schedule those in, in known vacancies, normally vacation. We see a calendar with vacation, and we would plug those people that would owe debit days back to the city into those positions. That cost is approximately 30 firefighters is what we're expecting, and that's going to be our hire for 2024 to be able to fill those vacancies that were formerly were partially covered by debit days. So we reduced the work week in this calendar, in this contract, from 46 hours to 42 a week? 46.15 to 42, yes, sir. For the same pay, I'm assuming. Well, right? the, the, uh, the percentages that you approved for... Um, normal increases are in there. I mean, but I know that's there, yes. but yes, is it, are they being paid hourly or are they being paid? Set? I mean, I guess that's the thing. So if they're working less, but they're getting paid less because they're working less hours or are they getting paid essentially, but you know, putting aside the percentage increase. So they're getting paid the same, but they're working less hours. That's what, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. That's my understanding of it. I can yeah. clarify I that with HR as well later down I, the road. I don't know what I think about that. I don't recall us being presented that, but that's... Chief Williams, is that is that the way you understand it? We'll get back to you. That's fine. We'll get okay. back to you. All right. Any other questions about that specifically? Yes, sir. Well, I'm just curious. Is Are you able to maybe estimate uh, kind of what the impact will be in our overtime next year versus this year? We've got, we're working with a, a person that was provided from the CFO to, to try to generate that exact number so that we're able to predict things, like look over the last couple of years, what trends for military deployments, long-term and long-term injuries, the routine use of sick time, uh, and, and try to develop what that, what that number's gonna be. So we're working on it. Uh, I've seen uh, some of the products that the person has done in the past, it looks like it's going to be relevant to our system, and I'm hopeful. Are you are you thinking it would be something closer to like a 15% reduction or a 50% reduction in our overtime costs? Yeah, I really don't know. There's so many variables that go into okay. it. Um, I mean, it would be it might. The optimist in me says, well, we're hiring all these new people. We can make an assumption. Most likely, they're going to be healthy and they're going to be younger. Not meant as a discrimination thing, but yeah. oftentimes when people are younger, they're healthier, and they like to come to work. And we get a lot of people that, um, that, that result in less sick days. On the contrary, though, I mean, that's the, that's the optimist. What I've learned is that younger people uh, get injured more because they're into crazy sports. We mm -hmm. hire very aggressive people. They ride dirt bikes. They climb mountains. They do things, and, and they get hurt. So... Sometimes, depending on uh, the cohort that we're looking at, we see some paradoxes that are really hard to plan for. So we're just looking for that average. Like, how in the world can we find, uh, can we make assumptions uh, with all these variables? There's got to be some way. Normally, it's by amassing a lot of data, but the data, uh, when you go back, you know, back 10 years even, it's not apples and apples. It's completely irrelevant. Yeah. So. We're doing our best with the tools that we have, and my hope is that we're going to see a substantial reduction in overtime because we're going to finally be staffed correctly with the number of people that we need. Okay. So that was my question on staffing. So we have a number of vacancies now that this, this current class or the next class will fill. You also anticipate retirement. Uh, as you said, the state laws, benefits have changed. So really, are we having a net gain? Are we, or are we just staying? That's, that's a great question. And, and what she's referring to is the pension enhancement. So we've already had two people that have announced their retirement that is going to cause a pretty significant trickle down. And a number of chiefs are at that retirement age. That'll, can, that'll impact. And then 
traditionally, we don't get notified when people intend to retire. It's very rare. So we're planning that, that class 2023-2 is going to be built with capacity, expecting that we'll need more than what we need today because we, we can't predict those variables. But from a gut standpoint, and I think probably where your gut is, we're going to see more people leave. They're going to be encouraged to leave. But at the same time, we also have a recession that is real and we're in it. So um, many of us are watching our 457s drop or 401s drop. That may be an impetus for people to stay longer. You know, it's, it's really, really hard to predict. I wish I had a crystal ball and I'd be able to put it together. It would help. Lori, are you I have making a, a comment? I have on a question on vacancies. So right now, how many vacancies do we have right now? Not counting this academy that's about to graduate. I just looked at Chief Williams. He told me 20. So we have only 20 vacancies, and they're essentially going to be filled by this academy that's? No, that's, that's with the that's academy with them. in place. So There's after this additions. academy, so starting the year, we'll have 20 vacancies. Yes, sir. And then we're going to create 30 vacancies by creating these new positions. So that's 50. And then how much do you expect to um, attend the two academies that are scheduled? That's right. Oh, pr probably up to 30 is what we'll try total. to do. Yeah, 30 and 30. So oh, 60, 60 total. And from previous reports, it seems like we were having a hard time filling our academies. What do you think, what's the trend on that? I mean, do you think you'll be able to fill those Actually, 60 this, spots? I didn't mean to talk over No, you. no. No, no I, from this last recruitment, we got over double the amount of people applying since we removed the EMT requirement. Okay. So we feel extremely optimistic about the number of people that are applying. Okay. And they're, I haven't seen the, <laughs> the diversity report from civil service yet because we'll wait until they actually give us mm -hmm. the names and we can get them scheduled because those interviews are starting i believe in two weeks so we're you know what we we work from uh the time that they're in the field and work backward so that timeline mm -hmm. is really compressed and unfortunately it's it's uh, eternal hiring it seems like so remember back when we passed the public safety levy and there were 20 firefighters included in that, right? 30. There were 30. Mm -hmm. So how does that figure in here? Is it figured in here? I don't think it is figured out because people go into that fund and move out of that fund depending on where they're assigned. But I believe, and I'm looking at Kevin now, how many people do we have in the public safety levy, Kevin? Kevin said, uh, we'll get back to you on the numbers. But in, in my mind, from a global standpoint, it's the fire department's budget is inclusive and those 30 positions are included in our, in our operational staffing period. So when we're reporting there's 20 vacancies, irrelevant of what the budget number is, where it's coming from, there are 20 firefighters. That, that's how we look at it. And Kevin's in the back end assigning a budget code to it. I just want to make sure that we're accounting for it. Absolutely. Yeah, that we're actually using that fund and it's not just sitting there. It, we're using that fund, but I mean, like, and this is another conversation about um, the draws on that fund. It was initially when we, when we all, I think, went to the public and sold it, it was, it was for firefighters and police. And I think over time, some of that may have been diverted. It was for diverted. firefighters, police, and criminal justice. Criminal justice, yeah. And... You know, it, it only has so much capacity, and we really need to be thinking not this year or next year, but five years from now, because uh, with the salary increases that, that go on, we really need to plan for those increases and see, just like the EMS levy, if into, you know, if into year six, if it's still going to have the capacity for 30, or if it's only going to be able to pay for 24. Right. Or that's, I have, uh, that keeps me up at night, that capacity on that public safety levy. Um, the work week changing from 46 to 42, does that start, or when does that start? 2024. Okay. So these 30 positions we're adding, we don't really need all 30 positions on January 1st, if I'm getting that right. We're well, gonna... the, the debit days won't exist on, on, um, on January 1st of 2024, so we'll need FTEs to fill in those positions. Right, but we're going to train up the people for these 30 positions. Right, in 2023. Right, and when there, what's the difference between 
when they're in academy what they're getting paid versus when they're done academy with uh, we've actually raised that amount uh, when when we recruit because our recruitment uh, salary was so low so yeah. they work together with civil service but to roughly raise like percentage wise uh, I I want to say it's probably they, they probably have a 25 percent increase over over the next couple of years to get to a top paid firefighter in four years but I mean from from when you're in the academy to when you go to a station what's the We've um, reduced it so it's almost seamless. It's almost It'll be a same. small increase, okay. but okay. not significant. That's my, okay. Health President. Thanks. I, I saw Tanya was trying to indicate she had something to add. You got it. Um, I, I think, uh, Council President, to your point of where, how much is budgeted for those 30 firefighters, we're assuming that those 30 firefighters start in the second academy so we've accounted for that in the budget. It's not a full annual amount for those 30 firefighters. Okay. So those, is that what you were? At that is what I'm trying to figure okay. out, is those yeah. 30 positions don't start until they the second academy. Okay. Correct, until the second academy, and we've taken that into account. We, we actually were breaking down their budget on a monthly basis okay. to determine how much per month. So that's what we would see is in July. That's what you see, correct. Okay, okay. Correct. great. That was my question. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I couldn't answer that uh, <laughs> exactly. I think the, the last thing I just mentioned is the situational tools that IT and fire have built for the supervisors at the battalion chief, division chief, assistant chief, deputy chief, and myself level that uh, we're actually able to monitor the, uh, the impact to staffing, the impact to the bottom line, uh, monitor sick time, debit time use, all of the items that were formerly um, ambiguous and again, relying on gut, now we actually have tools that were created to give us good situational awareness. Um, from a challenging point now though, another part of the collective bargaining agreement is, is minimum staffing. So now with minimum staffing, there, there is not uh, any flexibility moving forward to reduce staffing on a daily basis or possibly to close a company, um, to, to close one unit or another unit. That is, uh, that is a, a tool that that has been used in the past, specifically on the South Hill. Engine 9 was closed for some time. Engine 17 was closed on the north side for some time. And with that contract language, that eliminates that tool, which is good for the public from a safety standpoint. Uh, and I support. I just want to make sure that it's clear to everybody that that is not an option anymore to decrease staffing. OK. That's all I had. Um, Thanks for the time, and I'll pass it on to Thank you. the chief. Council President had to step out, and we'll be back for the legislative piece. So you have to deal with me now, kids. Good afternoon. Uh, am I waiting for the council president? I'm in charge now. Oh, God help us. Um, how much time do I have? You have until like 1228. 1228. We have to start oh, our okay. session at 1230. Okay. I'll, ta I'll talk fast. You listen fast. Um, I was asked to speak to specifically two topics, 2022 police overtime and then police staffing plan. Uh, in the packet I gave you, I went old school uh, with paper. You'll notice the first couple pages are going to be a summary breakdown of where our overtime has gone thus far this year through the end of September. Um, just a couple highlights on there I want to point out. Um, when you're looking at our overtime uh, this year, uh, about 380,000 of our overtime is uh, reimbursable. Uh, that's through things like um, some of the parade costs are, are reimbursed to us, um, some of the extra duties, et cetera. And um, then of course you got 586,000 in grants. The protests, uh, about $261,000 this year in protests, providing security at the shelters, including the, uh, the Trent shelter and then the, um, uh, the public facility district as well. That's about $300,000 in shelter security, uh, $101,000 um, in hoop fest, hoop fest costs that were, were not recoverable and then 81,000 in um, Bloomsday as well. But you'll see on here as you're going through the, the paper I gave you, the green, the, the green highlights are, are those that are reimbursable to the, the budget. Um, and then when you'll look at the, the gold color, you'll see those are parades and protests as well. Just a couple things I wanna highlight 
uh, real quick and happy to answer any questions. Uh, when you're looking at bar patrols right now on Friday, Saturday night, we do uh, five to six person bar patrols every Friday and Saturday night downtown. Uh, we tried stopping that several years ago just because it's all on overtime. We don't have the staffing to do that with on duty right now. Um, we had some ag assaults that went up quite a bit. So we, uh, we decided we need to bring back the bar patrols. It is expensive. Um, but we had some aggravated assaults that occurred and in one of the interviews with uh, the victim he said well I know you guys have bar patrols I thought you'd be long any minute they didn't know that for three weeks we canceled that so we we had to bring those back but you're talking thus far this year about 142 in bar patrols uh, duty related overtime that's obviously going to be a big one at about six hundred thousand uh, dollars related to to um, it could be anything from detectives to patrol officers uh, in services, we do three in services a year. We're required to give 24 hours of in service training by state law to all of our officers. Um, when you go down and you look at the learning, uh, you'll see about $160,000. In services are expensive. Uh, as you all know, training is expensive, uh, but we also know if we don't stay up on our training, bad things can happen. Uh, major crimes call outs was another, another big ticket item at $145,000 year to date. Um, then when you're looking at um, shift coverage, so we have a minimum a safety level staffing level for patrol um, if we dip below that we either call in officers on overtime uh, most of our officers don't want to come in on overtime so we hold over the prior shift to make to make sure we're keeping that minimum staffing level um, that thus far year to date is is six hundred thousand dollars as well um, and again i won't i won't go through this ad nauseum please read that at your leisure and if you have any questions i'm happy to answer have, those questions i, I want to know if we have questions right now on this because i have a few does anybody else have I, looking at um, police department meetings yeah I, that was mine like what what is um so uh, a lot of that is going to be so a lot of the meetings that we ask our folks to go to either the precinct commanders the lieutenants uh, the nro's are going to be in the evenings or they're going to be on the weekends okay so when they're if they're going to be attending those provide input and uh, updates then then they're going to be doing that during the off hours it also would include uh, can you get to the mic thank you <laughs> sorry it also would include the meetings for our field training officers they're spread across the patrol division at, and work all different hours but they meet on a regular basis to um, to advance the training of, of the recruits that we have going through the system um, you also have on page, uh oh, didn't number the pages, uh, page three, you've got blank for 92, almost 93,000. Yeah, and, and I was uh, speaking, I came about that. That's something we're going to have to fix internally. This just came to light through this. This is going to be when officers enter overtime and, and tell a staff it has to be approved by a supervisor. And they did not put the appropriate category. So that's something we need to work on through a, a training bulletin. So they make sure they click on the drop down menu to specify where that's going. Any other, go ahead. Yeah, I uh, had a question about the DOT camp and what the officers have been doing. I've heard a lot of community members say the officers um, who are there are not that helpful. They just kind of sit across the street. They're there from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. when there's more crime that's occurring in the opposite time from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. So just a question about that resource. Uh, in terms of you're saying that crime is occurring, that they're seeing and they're not doing anything, are you saying where's the coverage after 7 p.m.? Yeah, and that crime's more often likely to occur when the officers aren't there anyway because that's when crime occurs. It's more yeah. in the evening and yeah, early it, morning. It, and we, it, our officers aren't there during that time. Yeah, and actually we, we have heard that um, the officers are providing a uh, an effect by their presence there. So we would have things occur during the daytime in that neighborhood in the community as well. So one of the things we've heard um, actually from one of the, the individuals that was in the camp is that the folks in the camp know when our officers leave. They know at 7 p.m. they're going to leave and then that's when they'll come out um, so we we discussed trying to provide 24 7 coverage it would have to be an overtime it's just cost prohibitive I know that the city minister is trying to work with the state to see if WSP will cover that uh, right now they've been reluctant to do it my understanding is they're having staffing issues as well uh, but if we shifted to the nighttime uh, we don't have any doubt that we would start seeing those issues in the daytime as well. So it's it's six one way, half the other. We have to figure which 12 hour shift can we can we cover. Part of the other reason that we pick the daytime is a lot of those businesses we're having folks go into the Tapio Center, the gas station uh, surrounding 
surrounding neighbors, uh, taking things from their porch. So part of the reason we picked the daytime as well was so that when the businesses are open, those officers will be there to re be able to respond to that. But there was additional security for those businesses. I'm sorry? There was already additional private security for those businesses. Um, there is now. Yeah, there is now. DOC. No, there was before. That was part of the, the report that we got of all the costs. Only for Tapio. Only? Liberty, we didn't was, provide special security for Liberty Tire. We didn't provide special security for a whole lot of businesses. I was Only told, Tapio. Johnny said there were three that were spread out. I think it's in the I, Tapio Center. I think it was just Tapio. No, he said construction. Let's, let's yeah. check. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I guess that doesn't go to the question of like, them just sitting there and... Yeah, the, the other thing, too, as my uh, assumed mm -hmm. assistant chief pointed out, is one of the issues we've had was uh, Libby, uh, the Libby school there as well. So we have our officers go there in the morning. The parents were obviously very concerned, staff were. So that's the other part they're doing is every morning they're at the, the Libby school as well to be a presence. And just the, so I'm, I'm down there every week. I talk to the officers every week who are there. Um, unless a crime is being committed, I mean, they're not running through the camps and those kinds of things. They're just in that vicinity ready to respond to something should something happen at that time. And um, back to your point of the 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., crimes are going to be committed in one of those times. And I think what you said was really important that uh, business operational hours are happening from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, and so it, it definitely makes the people who are wanting to go to a Liberty Tire or something like that feel more comfortable that a police presence is there during during business hours. And, and I just I would just add one thing too. Uh, you know, in talking with uh, one of the officers who's been out there pretty frequently, because um, it's Similar to Councilman Bingle, I try to get out there two to three times a week just to keep an eye on things and talk to the officers and whatnot. But um, the uh, uh, the comment that was made to me was that they observed, um, because of their presence there, a five-year-old who had been hidden in that camp, and they observed them being taken from one portion of the camp to the other. And if they hadn't been there, sitting where they were, eyes on, um, which now is impossible because they've covered that camp with material that you cannot have eyes on, uh, which is really frustrating. But um, if it hadn't been for those eyes on that five-year-old, who knows what kind of victimization was going on in there. Yeah. It's really sad. Okay, we're going to move along. Okay. Um, and please, e if you have any questions, please email me as well. We'll be happy to, to research any questions you have and get back to you. Um, mm -hmm. So this is the uh, reconfiguration that we will be moving patrol to come January 8th. Um, I, I provided the actual PowerPoint that we went over with uh, our uh, our entire agency, as well as the presentation we've, we've uh, given to the community thus far. Uh, really what I want to do is just hit the highlight of it. Uh, you all know this, you've heard me say this ad nauseum, we are a call-driven agency. It, it is common when our officers log on, they'll have 20 calls holding. And as they're going through trying to clear the calls out, more calls are coming in. Um, so that obviously impacts fatigue, that impacts response times, that also impacts report writing times. If they're going call to call their entire shift, they don't have time to write their reports. They have to wait until the shift has ended, uh, and then they have to write the reports as well. So um, officers don't grow on trees. When an officer leaves, it takes at least a year to get a replacement based on when the academy starts. So every officer that leaves, it's going to be about a year until we can get a replacement for them. So we looked and said we need to be able to provide 911 service to the community. That's the number one priority. So we looked around at all of the police officers, different than detectives, the police officers assigned outside patrol so that we could beef up our patrol. Um, so what we're going to is, is you will see, well, hopefully it'll be about 40 to 45 officers come January 8th, um, but we do have multiple officers that have announced their intention to retire um, either before the end of the year or right at the end of the year. And then we always see a huge wave of retirements at the beginning of the year. But let's stick with what we're, we're being hopeful about uh, is we will get about 40 to 45 officers reassigned back to patrol. So we'll go from about 115 officers. This is, does not include sergeants or corporals. 115 officers to about, we're hoping, 150 to 155 officers on patrol. And instead of doing a north precinct and a south precinct and then downtown, we're going to sector. So Adams sector will have a captain and all of those officers will be assigned to Adams sector. And it, it really gets back to problem oriented policing or problem based policing. So if there's a problem at Dutch Jake Park, that Adams sector captain is responsible for addressing that. And they have graveyard resources, they have the mid shift resources, day shift resources. Uh, same thing for, for uh, Baker sector as well. If there's an issue at Dwight Merkel, that captain is responsible for that and they will report to the major what they're doing to address those issues. So it gives more accountability 
but it will also give us more officers, which we hope will help with fatigue, help with response times, save on report writing, save on shift coverage. Um, bar patrol, again, we're, with the, the movement of officers back to patrol, uh, we're anticipating having bar patrols be part of the downtown sector's responsibility now, so we won't have to call officers in. And when I say call in, it's, it's mandated. The officers, most officers don't wanna work those. We always get a couple that do, but it will be part of the downtown sector's responsibility, which will so save over time. Downtown will be a separate? Correct. Okay, go ahead. Just a quick question. So will those officers that are going to be in those sections, will they be <clears throat> housed in those sections, like at a cop shop or? That's a great question. That came up, not yet. Um, and part of the issue um, we talked about is, um, because, because for patrol, we don't have enough cars for everyone, they have to rotate their cars. There's nowhere, there's nowhere for them to, um, there's no facility in Adams sector that is big enough for the entire team to meet. Um, and then with um, Char uh, Charlie sector, the south, what is now the south precinct, um, they have to rotate their cars, so they would have to, in essence, they would have to come to the station before their shift, get their car, and then drive out to the sector. Mm -hmm. um, so, that, and I don't wanna pay them to, to get their car at their start time and then drive out for their roll call and then have roll call for 20 minutes and then drive to their deployment. You're talking, if we're paying them to get their car at the station and then drive out to the precinct building and then have roll call, you're talking probably 45 to an hour at the beginning of every shift to have them actually at the precincts, there. if that makes sense. My other thing would be a comment. Um, I would like to see a Karen sector. <laughs> uh, a what? A Karen, Karen sector. Gosh. Karen sector. Karen sector, yeah. Yeah. You have let's all talk. The, <laughs> let's talk. Yeah, let's work on that. Yeah. Okay. We don't have very long to go, so let's. Um, that, that's the highlights. I just okay. wanted to open up for questions as well. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Chief, what are we doing to increase response times around track? Around when, the, the, when issues occur. And there was one in particular that just happened. Um, I just talked to a constituent, I think, yesterday. Uh, they, so kind of two parts of the story. One night, 6 p.m., uh, caught a guy trying to break into their neighbor's house. They followed him, chased him to track, went into track. They couldn't get access to him at that point. The next night, 2.30 in the morning, the same individual came back and broke into their house. So not their neighbor's, their house. They caught the guy in their home, waited for 30 minutes, and no, no police response came. The guy took off. They did catch him eventually when the, the officer did arrive, but it was well over 30 minutes yeah. that they had to wait while they were essentially detaining a guy in their home. And you, you, have, you have summarized the crux of the issue and why we're moving folks back to patrol as well is because of those response times. So there's a couple variables involved. When someone calls in, um, the, the call taker is in, inputting the data they're hearing. Sometimes that data is accurate. Sometimes they don't hear necessarily what the person's conveying or thinks they're conveying. And then we have a prioritization system, uh, basically a priority one, two, or three. Uh, priority one is gonna be things like shootings, robberies, bank robberies, things like that. Those will always be the top priority. Priority twos are, gonna, are going to be in progress calls, um, domestic violence, um, assaults, fights, things of that nature. And then priority threes are gonna be, let's call them your cold incidents where the suspect has left. Mm -hmm. There's no threat to anyone any longer. Um, so it goes back to what I'd, I'd shared earlier when officers are logging on and, and they're not uncommonly, not every day, but not uncommonly seeing a page of 20 calls. So it could be uh, one of two things. It could be how the data was entered, if it was, in, if it was entered accurately. Sometimes it, it's not, uh, most of the time it is. Um, but then it just has to, do we have officers available or are they tied up on higher priority calls? If you have an, an active crime in progress like that with, with um, community members chasing them, that will be a higher priority, but that doesn't mean the officers aren't already tied up on a higher priority too. So we're hoping by shifting 40 to 45 more officers, we're gonna have a lot more availability as well. But I, I, in this case, being that it was pretty, pretty close to trend, track, um, you know, we've talked ad nauseum about how we're gonna emphasize uh, having you know, quick responses and taking care of issues around that site. I'm just, I'm hoping that we have a battle plan in place to very specifically address, especially if as and, and when that, that location ramps up in population, um, it's gonna become a bigger and bigger concern for those neighbors and we, we've gotta dial in that response time. You know, it, it is, I, I will tell you this, this is because they have a responsibility to the entire South Precinct mm -hmm. and it's gonna be based on those call priorities that come in. Um, and this is the, one of the reasons why you see we assign two officers to the, the camp at, at second and um, Thor, 
because they're not tied up on calls, they're not responding to other calls, they're always available right there. The only way we can guarantee officers will be available right away is to assign them specifically there. And that, that would be the only way. Otherwise, they're going to be all over. They could be up at 57th or they could be over in Brown's edition, tied up on DVs, assaults, robberies, things like that. When this comes out, there's just nobody to send. But we're hoping by building up the officers, we'll see a change. Mm -hmm. that's, that's part of the big reason we're doing and this. And can we then have a conversation once your plan is in place? Because to your point, we're seeing more crime around that area. Yeah and not just homeowners, but businesses as well. So it might be we need to have this discussion about actually assigning officers, like maybe have it its own um, quadrant. Maybe that is the Karen sector, <laughs> and we have its own quadrant, and we have officers assigned there. Yeah. Because as it ramps up and more people are in the track, um, it, it's not gonna get better. Yeah, we can do that. It comes at a consequence, though, because then that means the rest of the south side is going to have one or two less officers available mm -hmm. to take those higher priority calls. So we can we can always do that. There's always a consequence for things like that, unless we're doing like what we're doing at the camp. It's like you're on overtime, that's and I'm not I'm proposing saying. that. That's that's what I'm suggesting. Is we it might. I have a quick question. So quickly, talk to me about recruitment. Um, so I was pretty excited in uh, 2020, 2021, when I was hearing about all these other agencies struggling to hire. Um, and then uh, 2022 hit. And so we have, as of last week, we have 18 people on our new hire list. That sounds really good. But when you look at our averages, we only hire one candidate for about every 10 to 12 people that apply. So that list of 18, we've got two, probably two statistically that we'll get out of there that we will accept through the background, the polygraphs and the interviews. We have 16 vacancies uh, right now. We have uh, anticipated four retirements uh, by the end of the year, and then we know we'll have another wave at the beginning of the year. So we'll go into January with 20 vacancies, and then uh, we will, and you heard Chief Schaefer say, most of the time people don't tell us when they're leaving. Um, I am hopeful we have no more than 10, but we'll probably have more like 15 to 20 more retirements the first half of 23. And each of those positions, again, is going to take about a year to fill. So the short answer is we're, we're starting to see, not starting, we are now seeing the struggles that others are seeing as well. Just one quick comment. I would just like to make an appeal to our Washington State Patrol friends uh, to potentially consider giving us a couple um, dedicated officers to patrol that time from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. as we've been asking them because it is cost prohibitive. Yeah. There is a role that the state is playing in this and so for them to assign some officers seems to be a reasonable and a fair ask from the city and so I'd just like to throw that appeal out to Washington State Patrol. So, yeah. I thought they were already doing that. Yeah. They don't staff the, in the way that we have our two officers from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. We're asking them to do two from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Okay. So. Uh, my understanding is they're doing uh, extra duty overtime at the Fred Myers. Okay. If yes. you see in that area. As private security for Fred Meyer. Yeah. How am I doing on time? He's back. All right. I was told I have to tell 28 after. <laughs> Any other questions? And I will be sure and watch this section. I was actually talking with one of our state senators about criminal justice improvements and Blake decision and how to address that. And I, that was my only time that I could talk to her, and, but uh, Senator Dingra, so I appreciate you uh, Great. letting me do that. But I'll watch and we probably have some more questions. I see comprehensive material, so thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think that's gonna be all for study session. I'm gonna gavel that close and in a few minutes we'll gavel open the meeting. Our TV people need just a little bit to um, change up things, but we'll be starting our... Okay, so we're done with study session and we'll be uh, on break just for two minutes.
mic's on. Good afternoon and welcome to a special uh, legislative session of the Spokane City Council for today. Uh, we have uh, three things that we're going to be covering that we noticed uh, just about 24 hours ago and four minutes. Uh, one is a resolution uh, amending and ratifying the mayor's um, uh, declaration of civil emergency or disaster related to the uh, operational changes at the Trent shelter or track. And then on the consent agenda, we have uh, two contracts, one with uh, both with the Salvation Army, one to operate the Cannon Street shelter and one to operate the Trent Avenue homeless shelter. Um, those are consent items. We're going to take testimony. Um, first on the resolution, and then we'll do the consent agenda. So, uh, actually, but Ms. Fister, if you could please call the roll. Council President Biggs? Here. Council Member Bingle? Here. Council Member Cathcart? Present. Council Member Kinnear? Present. Council Member Stratton? Here. Council Member Wilkerson? Present. Council Member Zapone? Here. Let the record reflect that all council members are present. All right, could you read the resolution title? Resolution number 2022-96, the resolution amending and ratifying the mayor's October 26, 2022 executive declaration of civil emergency or disaster, whereas on October 26, 2022, Mayor Nadine Woodward issued an executive declaration of civil emergency or disaster in the city of Spokane hereafter the declaration pursuant to SMC 2.04.030 due to the public emergency faced at the Trent Resource and Assistance Center, and whereas the city executed an agreement with the Guardians Foundation to operate a public low barrier shelter named the Trent Resource and Assistance Center and has determined to terminate the contract and agreement with the Guardians Foundation for operation of track, and whereas it is crucial to continue care for the unsheltered individuals at track with no or minimal charge change in services during the transition to a new operating agency, and whereas the city has contracted with Salvation Army in the past and has found the services rendered to be of the highest level and to be of reasonable rates relating to other provider contracts entered into over the past 24 months. And whereas the city and the Salvation Army Spokane are prepared to enter into an agreement to provide operational services at TRAC and to minimize the impact on unsheltered individuals during the transition. And whereas an emergency ex exists that it necessitates utilization of the emergency powers granted pursuant to RCW 38.52 and or 35A.33. Now therefore be it resolved that the Spokane City Council section one as a result of the termination of the contract with the Guardians Foundation, there is a present disaster or civil emergency which necessitates the utilization of emergency powers granted pursuant to chapter 2.04 Spokane Municipal Code, Spokane Min Municipal Code 7.06.180 and RCW 35.52.070 subsection 2 which are lawful proper and reasonable exercises of the city of Spokane's police power consistent with state law and the city charter section 2 the executive declaration of civil emergency or disaster by mayor Woodward dated in effective October 26 2022 is hereby ratified by the city council by this resolution section 3 notwithstanding the executive declaration of civil emergency or disaster the city council reserves its full authority under the city charter to take any and all necessary steps to safeguard the public health, safety, and welfare of all residents of Spokane, including without limitation, any necessary measures to mitigate the effects of an economic disruption in connection with the disaster or civil emergency and prioritization of the use of funds or resources received from the state and or federal governments. Section 4, the civil emergency shall continue until a new contract for operating the Trent Resources and Assistance Center has been executed by all parties or terminated by the mayor or by city council resolution. Section 5, a copy of this resolution and the executive declaration of civil emergency of disaster shall be delivered to the governor of the state of Washington and to the Spokane County Board of Commissioners. To the extent practical, a copy of this resolution and the declaration shall be made available to all news media within the city and the general public in order to give the widest dissemination of this resolution and the declaration to the public as many other available means may be used as are practical. All right, and before we hear from the administration on this and, and consider it, uh, we usually um, would need to present this at a committee before and give more notice. So I'm looking for a motion to suspend the rules. So move rule suspension. Second. All right, any discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any, aye, any opposed nay, any abstentions? And then I'm looking for a motion to add resolution 2022-0096 to today's agenda for consideration. So moved. Second. Any discussion? 
All those in favor of adding to the agenda, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? All right, it's so added to the agenda. And Mr. Perkins, if you could address what the civil emergency is and why um, uh, declaring one is necessary for addressing it. Yes, sir. Thank you, Council President, members of the City Council, Johnny Perkins, uh, City Administrator. Joining me today from City staff is our Interim City Attorney, Lyndon Smithson, Lyndon Smithson uh, Assistant City Attorney, Margaret Henson, Neighborhood Housing and Human Services Interim Director, Eric Finch, Assistant Police Chief, Justin Lundgren, and from the Salvation Army, Major Ken Perrine, David Kaufman, and Human Resources Representative, Mary Douglas. Due to the transition and the quick turnaround in terms of contract uh, ad adherence and contract terms in order to continue the services at both uh, track the Trent Resource and Assistance Center as well as the Cannon Shelter, uh, we were asking for this emergency uh, declaration to allow us to have you consider and hopefully approve and support the contract with the Salvation Army so we don't have to go through an RFP given the sensitive nature of transitioning this contract, uh, particularly to the population that we're serving and the continuum of services that we need to provide both at the Trent Shelter and the Cannon Shelter. So we would ask for your I vote in support of that emergency declaration. And when we get to the contract, we might um, hear more from the Salvation Army, but any questions from Council for Mr. Perkins at this point? Council Member Cathcart. Uh, good Neighbor Agreement. So a Good Neighbor Agreement, uh, Council Member Cathcart is included in this contract, of the two contracts that we're gonna uh, have you consider here shortly. The Good Neighbor Agreement is included in that packet. Are there any, to, to your understanding, are there any changes, and maybe they can answer this better, but changes to how they would operate the facility versus how it's been operated? Part of this process for the Salvation Army will be a 60 to 90 day assessment to kind of ascertain how things have been operating, how things have been managed, what resources may be needed beyond uh, those that have currently been allocated and supported by you from a financial standpoint. Uh, as I, I, we get into those details here in a moment, I will tell you the contract we're actually asking you to approve is as is, and as is meaning the same level of service program commitment and including the security measures that we had put in place, as well as the funding that you had allocated when this contract to the previous provider was approved. But we are going to have a 60 to 90 day assessment to allow the Salvation Army to come in and take a look at the operations, see if there's anything they believe needs to be modified, changed, or in fact, enhanced. Councilmember Bingle. A couple of questions. So if the time comes that modifications are determined that uh, would they would like to be implemented, um, what would that process look like? Would we need to amend a contract at that time? If it involves the potential for additional funds, yes, we would need to come in and have that discussion with you, and I will commit to you that uh, once that 60 to 90 days is complete, uh, we will come in and have that conversation with you so you understand what the assessment is showing, and we're even more than happy to come before the council and a committee as well to make that presentation to determine what we've found in this 60 to day uh, uh, review. And then if it does involve a change in service or enhancement or financial side, we will come uh, to you well before standing here and presenting it to you without having that conversation. My, my other question is, um, Salvation Army stepping into this uh, or these facilities, um, will they just assume the employees who are currently working there? This is one of the criteria that the mayor and myself insisted that each employee for the track and guardians, um, pardon me, a cannon site will be offered employment by the Salvation Army so long as they are able to meet the requirements of the human resource function of the Salvation Army. But the intent is all of those who want to stay, they will be offered jobs so long as they meet that criteria that the Salvation Army puts out for employment. Do we anticipate any barriers to assuming all of those employees? In discussions with Salvation Army, no. Okay. Councilmember Stratton. I just want to clarify for just folks that have contacted me. So this is an executive declaration, civil emergency, relating to the Cannon Shelter and the Trent Shelter operations going to Salvation Army. Mm -hmm. And none of this um, is about Camp Hope. Is that correct? Yes, Council Member Stratton. Okay. This is specifically Perfect. the operations and the current contract that is held by the previous provider that we are asking you to consider 
and support and approve for the Salvation Army to take over operations at Trent as well as the Cannon Shelters as is with the same funding level and the same level of service with the offer to employ all those that are currently there so long as they meet the criteria established by the Salvation Army. Okay. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Councilmember Zappone. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you could be more clear, is this related to the embezzlement charges that have been brought up or is this completely different? Over the last few weeks, we as staff in discussions with the mayor, there's just something that wasn't right. And so per the direction of the mayor, she asked me, Johnny, I need you to look into this a little bit more. You've dealt with multi-million dollar contracts in the waste business. Can you, can you take a look at this a little bit more? So we looked at this harder. And what we found what there is that there was the inability to maintain accurate records uh, to account for expenditures and performance, which are terms that are very clear in the contract. We also found that uh, there were no established and maintained maintain systems of internal accounting that in fact comply with the applicable general accepted uh, accounting principles, the GAAP. And those two items are very clear in the contract. So under sections 10A and 10B of the current agreement, uh, we were able to look at that and make the decision to move in the direction with the Salvation Army, which has a, a background and experience which uh, includes transitioning homeless into uh, not only temporary, but transitional as well as permanent housing and operate a, a facility that will allow that transition to occur in a very seamless manner within the confines of the expenditures. We have a fiduciary responsibility, council members opponent, as I know you and the council members do as well. And so prior to even those two uh, items being completed, that being the forensic audit and the other investigation, we took a look at some things and just determined we needed to make a change for the, for the uh, protection of the taxpayers of the city, the city itself, as well as the occupants of both sites. So do, you said that something fell off for a couple weeks. So is that before embezzling became publicly known or about when did you start looking into this matter? So this separate action mm -hmm that I just highlighted for you in the letter that we provided to the previous provider yesterday was something within the last two or three weeks after the initial in investigation by, on the criminal investigation and the forensic right. audit. Those, those were underway. Right, separate to that. Separate, this and so separately, I have a lot of experience looking at big contracts, and so I started really spending a lot of time on the weekends looking at what was in this contract some of the uh, irregularities. And though based on that, we felt at this time, we don't need to wait for the other two to conclude. Those are gonna continue to, to yeah, run I, their course. I was just wondering, was that before or after it came to your attention that there was embezzling? This was, this was after. After. Yes, sir. Uh, Councilmember Wilkerson. And I just wanna state again, it's declared an emergency because Others have asked why this did not go out for a RFP. And under this emergency declaration, it did not have to go out to a RFP. That's correct, Council Member Wilkerson. The declaration allows us to transition to the Salvation Army without an RFP. And the, the short time period that we're t discussing here, where the Salvation Army would, would assume operations on November 1, there just isn't the time. And, and frankly, the public health and safety of those that we're caring for at both facilities uh, is in play and we wanted to make sure that there was a seamless uh, transition from the current provider to, to the Salvation Army. If, if I can just come back to Council Member Sapone's comments really quick. Mm -hmm. Once we were, uh, once it was determined and we were uh, advised that there was potential embezzlement and fraud and some other things with the finances, uh, that's when the mayor directed uh, a forensic audit be under, undertaken. And as you recall, Council Members, you had uh, made a recommendation uh, as it relates to the other investigation. Mm -hmm. So those things were initiated f following that. Did you want to add something? Just for Council Member Wilkerson, uh, I would just also add for the last RFP cycle, uh, the Salvation Army was the, the second applicant, you know, of two, uh, along with, with the Guardians. Good to see you back, Mr. Finch. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will ask um, Salvation Army about that. So when they are up to the yeah, just one more item. And I know this isn't exactly why we're, why we're here, but I just want to bring it up. 
um, you know, early on in the conversation around Trent, the, at least it was relayed to me, and maybe, maybe I heard this differently than others, but it was relayed to me that access was going to be uh, mostly focused on bus, van, shuttle, and we would try to uh, deter folks from being on foot, le especially leaving on foot and, and potentially impacting the neighborhood. Um, just yesterday had a constituent who had her house broken into from a, a person seemingly from Trent. And the reason they know that is the day before they chased them to Trent on a bike. Um, and they were allowed into Trent and, they, and the folks who were trying to identify this person were not allowed into Trent. And so seemingly this person sought refuge in Trent and uh, was not able to be identified. Uh, and so I just want to make sure that we're having conversations around what access looks like, uh, security, if there is um, uh, any sort of accusation or, or evidence of something going on that the police are in fact called and brought in so that we can get it sorted out. Um, because it seems like that's not what has happened in the past. And so I just want to make sure that those are conversations that will be had as we move forward in this new partnership. Uh, absolutely. And this is the first I've heard of that. So I appreciate you bringing that to my attention. Certainly, uh, we will address that with the new provider, uh, should you uh, consider and approve them this afternoon, the Salvation Army. But up to now, I have to say the operation as it relates to our security operations and our phone number for people to call in with questions and concerns about what's happening in the community. By all indications, that's worked fairly well up to this point. So uh, these things like this, I really appreciate knowing so we can address those immediately. Council President? Council President Stratton. One more quick question. Um, both shelters, the Cannon and Trent, those will both continue to be low barrier, correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Kinnear. And will both Cannon and Track be uh, program for services? Right now, we only have funding to do that at TRAC, and I'm going to defer to Mr. Finch. I don't believe there's funding for that activity at Cannon that I'm aware of, unless he knows something and, and, different. And I'll uh, let the good major talk to what the Salvation Army can, can, can provide in its normal mm -hmm. sense, but uh, the, the original contract with, with, for, for Cannon uh, had some a level of services built in, but it was not to the level that we obviously extended to try to do at, at, at Trent. Uh, in the and the the resource center there, so th there is there is a step up right in what we are, are envisioning for the, the the track center than from what we originally had at Cannon, but th it's just a two month artifact for the current Cannon contract, and then I think as they do their assessment, that gives us the opportunity to roll that intelligence into um, you know the next contract or proposal. It's important to note that everything will continue as is currently being provided, and this sixty to ninety days will give us a better idea of. Are there additional enhancements or modifications that we'll need to make? Thank you. Council Members Pump. I'm just wondering in our systems and protocols, it didn't seem like this issue that you brought forward now to terminate their contract was in our normal procedures. It was a special issue that you had to look into um, on the weekends. So why was that missed in our protocols and our review process? We're taking a hard look at all of our protocols, all of our reviews. Uh, staff did a great job of bringing to my attention in this two to three week period some of these irregularities that I'm pointing to now in terms of payroll submittals, expense submittals. So staff did notice some of these irregularities to their credit. They've spent a lot of hours looking at payroll submittals, expense report submittals, and, and timeliness of, the, of those submittals. So. What we will do, the Salvation Army, I'm sure the major can address this. There's a different process that they have for payroll and expenses. Uh, but our staff, I think, did a really good job in these last three weeks as it relates to identifying some of these concerns with some of these payroll submittals, which, again, were, are separate from the two issues previously, the forensic audit on the uh, alleged embezzlement as well as the other investigation. This was separate from that in terms of just the, 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 the weekly – uh, reporting of payroll and expense that we would in through invoices that we we would approve mm -hmm. the staff's credit they did bring to my attention there's some irregularities and and I, that's when I decided I've really we've really got to do a deep dive to figure out what is going on but it sounds like none of this happened until embezzlement became public I, I, from I, what you said it was at the direction after embezzlement. I, I, th I think the staff had seen a few they weren't to the level of what we've seen in the last few weeks. There was some administerial issues with their submittals for payroll and expenses, 
but it didn't rise to the level of, of violating the clear terms of the contract in terms of how you account and keep records and the principles you're to use as it relates to your accounting. So uh, we had noticed some of that. Staff had been working with uh, the previous provider to address those. But as these things continue to evolve and be brought to our attention, now you have a potential contract issue that needed to be uh, looked into further. Councilmember Wilkerson. Uh, Mr. Perkins was at both locations, the irregularities in their reporting and submitting. So they weren't submitting just one invoice for track and Canon. They were two separate contracts. So were we seeing that at Canon as well? Yes, we were. Councilmember Cathcart. Are we able to require um, anybody who contracts with the city to essentially provide us with kind of a, a, a data dump, for lack of a better term, so that we can do reviews such as this to catch irregularities proactively? Yes, we are. And those are the things that we're looking at internally as to how this information comes in. But again, I want to really credit our staff, our CHHS staff, uh, Devin Biviano, Skylar Brown, and from finance, Michelle Murray, who really assisted in digging deep into these irregularities that we've, we've seen here in the last three weeks that ultimately provided the support that led to this decision to make the change. Councilmember Zippo. Yeah, I, I guess from a public perspective, there's a lot of concern about trust and going back and also going forward. Guardians has been around and we've been paying Guardians for a while now. Um, they were the provider during the emergency warming center, which had extremely high costs. Uh, some of that was associated with laundry costs being thousands of dollars. I went by, I don't really remember seeing any linens or anything. Um, when we look at the Cannon Shelter, we see from uh, October 1st to June 30th of the last year, there was $285,000 in just laundry. So how do we know those charges are not also fraudulent charges. So all the previous charges within the last 18 months are part of that uh, uh, audit and forensic review by our finance team and our, and our team from CHHS. We are looking at all of those previous invoices over the last 18 months, including uh, council members upon the time period that you, you just referenced. Um, I want to say uh, we continue to learn a lot about uh, what was going on. We will continue to improve our systems to make sure that taxpayers' dollars are protected. And I think by bringing in the Salvation Army, who has a track record and experience of, of managing and leading these kinds of shelters, which tra transition homeless from uh, transitional housing to temporary to permanent, is, you're gonna see a, a, huge, a huge difference. But we are, gonna t we are looking at those issues now to determine if there was any irregularities from those, those invoices as well. And so I'm just wondering why, why didn't we have this before it was publicly known that someone self-admitted to embezzling? Like where's our, right, what are we doing as a city to assure that it's, we're safeguarding against this? Um, it seems like in the process of choosing the RFP for the guardians or some red flags, like they didn't have their 501c3 status, even though their letter had stated that they were a nonprofit on it. Like why did these things not come up through the RFP process why have we not been reviewing this? How can we not assure the public that we are doing a good job? I can assure you and the taxpayers and the public that the systems checks that we are looking at and will put in place will address those very issues going forward. Uh, but staff has done a very good job of identifying some of those inconsistencies and, and frankly, to the credit of, of the previous provider, they, they did do a lot of great work. There's no question they did some great work. The inconsistencies and the regularities on the accounting side and the financial side, which we take very seriously because we have a fiduciary responsibility, uh, are such that, that that change needed to, to take place. And let me speak to the knowing. It was brought to my attention at the end of September about the alleged embezzlement and fraud. And I know there's, uh, there's been discussions about a letter out in August and that's being uh, looked at by the current the current other two investigations that, that, that are happening. Uh, but as soon as it was brought to my attention, discussions with the mayor, her direction was to do the forensic audit. And then the other investigation came about with your, your guidance and input, and we initiated that uh, as well. So uh, my email went out. I went back and looked, because so, I was anticipating that question. On Thursday, October 6th at 9.57 p.m., 
that's when I gave the direction to our staff to engage in the forensic audit. Uh, it wasn't until a few days earlier when I found out there was this allegation of potential fraud and, and embezzlement. Councilmember Cathcart. One, yeah, one more. Um, the, uh, typically when there's a big change or something happens like this, it's a pretty swift transition, but my understanding is there's a bit of lag time between the, the new uh, provider coming in and the, the previous provider going out. How, how is that being managed just from a data security, et cetera, standpoint? You mean a lag time between today and November 1st? Yeah. Uh, I, can, I can probably have Major Ken speak to that when he comes up uh, here at when, when we introduce the next items. Uh, but th there has already been discussions with the previous provider about what that transition looked like. In my conversations with them yesterday when we announced we were taking this step, uh, we, we, we made sure, at least in terms of my conversations with them, uh, to please be respectful of this process, be professional, please support the Salvation Army with everything that they, that they need. I believe the Salvation Army staff is either going to be in there today or tomorrow. Uh, that's why Ms. Douglas is here from the, uh, the Human Resources Department of Salvation Army to start th that process and to make that transition occur. Um, Member Stratton. I was just going to clarify with Council Member Zappone that um, I sent an email, just so you know, I sent an e email to Johnny Perkins on the 7th regarding what I had heard that day. So that's, I think. So that's the just, night before, yeah. I had actually already sent out the communication to our staff on giving direction on initiating the forensic audit. Uh, and then it was that Saturday, because I think that was in October, it was a Saturday, I recall, is when I uh, called all of you and either spoke with most of you or left a message and to advise you of what, what was happening. Yeah, so if there are substantial irregularities found through this audit, what happens next? Will there be legal charges? Will be, there be a third party that does this? It seems like it's kind of I haven't seen the mayor stand up and speak about this. I mean, not just potential fraud and self-admitted embezzlement, but now we have other irregularities. Where's, where's the strong coming down on this? Because I know back in August when we were doing, or July, the first RFP, there was strong conviction that the RFP process was corrupted and that we had to start the whole process over again. Um, this is clearly corrupted operations and embezzlement. So why the difference between the two, I guess? Well, I'm not sure if it's clearly. I mean, I, I, have, to, I have to wait until the forensic audit and the criminal investigation are completed before there's any recommendation by the city attorney on what those next steps are. Today, I'm only here to ask for the Salvation Army to be approved to be the operator for track and cannon on an emergency basis because we need to make this change now. And I'm here to go by what we've done in the last three weeks at the mayor's direction to look at some of these irregularities that, that those that I can prove now, the forensic audit and the criminal investigation are looking at other things, but in knowing today mm -hmm. what we've looked at in the last three weeks, there are clear discrepancies in the accounting practices and there are clear violations of the current contract. Therefore, a change needs to be made right now. I cannot wait until those two investigations are completed. That, that's not um, responsible. From a fiduciary standpoint, nor is it responsible as a city administrator for the city and working for all of you to wait. This needed to happen as soon as I was able to prove these violations were concurrent with the violations of the contract. We needed to move forward. And you'll come back and update us when it is done. We, we will, and I'll, I'll have to le lean on the city attorney because that could be something that's outside of my purview. This is within the city administrator's purview and the mayor's purview today to clearly come to you with these these uh, proven uh, discrepancies in how the contract was being managed and clear violations of 10A and 10B uh, or uh, violations of the agreement that allow us under 10A and 10B to make this change today. All right. There's a reason why you had to speak first because you were going to get all these questions. So okay. thank you for, uh, for doing that. Thanks sure. for doing that. Uh, we do have some public comment. I wanted to... Note just one thing for those of you, if you're watching, the original resolution um, that was published had 
uh, was an older version and it was quickly changed on it. So if for some reason you saw the very first one and it's slightly different than the one that was read, that's why. But that's been publicly noticed and essentially the main difference is that um, the expiration of the emergency is upon the signing by both parties of the contract and then the emergency goes away because this emergency is mm -hmm. just related to the contract. It's not related to, there could be another emergency about homelessness and things like that, but this is just that. So just wanted to clarify that. With that, we have two people um, who have signed up to testify, um, Catherine Corrick and Barry Barfield. You both testified in the past. Catherine, come on up. You have up to three minutes. And I think you're familiar with the rules, so I'm not gonna repeat them. But welcome to City Council. Thank you. I'm just pleased to see this step being taken um, without any further delay. And I'm glad to hear in the previous um, testimony from Mr. Perkins that it's gonna go back 18 months and see what's been going on since day one with the previous contractor. And I'd like to applaud both the mayor and you as a council for getting on the same page on an issue for once. Not once, but you know, um, at this time, anyway. It's a great thing to see, and I think we need to see more of this kind of thing. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And Barry. <clears throat> Hello, Council. My name is Barry Barfield. Um, I served on the Community Housing and Human Services Volunteer Board for two and a half years. I resigned in June. Uh, the last six months of it, I was chair of that, that board. So I had very close communication and contact with the CHHS staff. Um, and it is my view, I don't have any confidence that this has not happened before, as, Mr., as Councilman Zappone was asking. And it's not for lack of competency or caring or hard work by the staff. I have Mr. Finch and other staff members that I interacted with care deeply about these programs and work very hard. I wonder why, when I started two and a half years ago, why there has been a mass exodus of very talented staff from the Community, Human, Community Housing and Human Services Department. I don't know, I haven't talked to them. I suspect it stands at, uh, lands at the mayor's feet. Somehow there is, um, it's hard to keep people in that department. It's hard to hire people in that department. When I was, as I, when I was on the board, I would get reports about openings and postings and interviews and job offers and people turning the positions down. So I think that department just needs a lot more staffing. Um, I think that department, that's their job to keep an eye on these types of contracts. And I don't fault the staff one bit. There's something systemically wrong from my view, um, I mean, it's a difficult position to be in. Housing and homelessness is a difficult job. And I have talked to people in previous years who have left and they say, yeah, you're, you're on the firing line for a lot of very hot button issues. So it's not an easy position to be in. Um, I would just suggest council and the administration address beefing up that department and supporting it and having sufficient staff to do the appropriate oversight. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Barry. Um, all right, so we're here now for any council commentary on the resolution, which is amending and ratifying the emergency declaration. Well, I'm gonna create time for comment, even though there consent agenda on the contracts when we get to that and hear from uh, other people. But is there any commentary on the resolution that essentially allows um, to immediately go into contract and bypass the normal RFP process. Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, just really quickly, um, you know, whether, whether real or perceived, uh, our city can't, just can't be involved in, in 
um, a relationship with a contractor that, that may be having some pretty serious legal issues. And so um, as difficult as it is to make these sorts of decisions, it's the decision that we absolutely have to make. So I'll leave it there and I'll be supporting. Any other commentary? Councilmember Stratton. I just want to thank everybody for working on this. I'm glad that we're finally dealing with this. It's been a couple weeks out there in the community, and I, I, I am disappointed that there wasn't more of a, um, the mayor coming out in public with the city administrator and council president. You know, we could have planned that better to stand up and say this is happening in our community, and we're going to fix it, and we're going to talk about it in public and be open and transparent about it. So I'm glad we're here today. I'm glad for everybody's work. I'm glad it's something I think we all agree on, which is a good thing. Um, so I will support this. Any other commentary? Councilmember Wilkerson. Uh, first of all, I'll just say thank you to the Guardians for the work that you did do uh, because you stepped into a gap that nobody else was willing to fill at that time in the expectations were almost unrealistic to get that uh, shelter up and running in the time frame that they did. We continue to struggle with the homelessness, the issues, the housing part. Um, I will be supporting this absolutely and, and thanks to the Salvation for stepping up. But we continue to be challenged with the leadership in that department and we will continue to be challenged with the funding of the services that are being provided. This has been going on since back in the spring and it's been one upset after another or one disappointment after another and that in our community, we do not have that many service providers that can provide this level of service to this many people. And in the next few weeks, we'll be asking them to surge up to over 200 people. That's a high bar for anyone. So I just want us to go forward and look at our expectations realistically and our funding source realistically of what we can do to help the people who need it the most in our community. Councilmember Bingle. Yeah, um, serving on the CHHS board, you, you certainly see how impacted that, that department is. Um, and I think Mr. Barfield touched on this. It's a very difficult um, department to be a part of because homelessness is the issue of our day. It's the issue of our city um, uh, above probably all others. Um, and so being in that department, you are constantly under, under scrutiny. Um, you know, you make a decision and, you know, there's a lot of passion behind um, this issue. Um, it, is, it is tough to be incredibly effective, um, you know, without... A, a full staff in there and one of the troubles that we know that we're facing across the city you know uh, every department I mean we have hundreds of vacancies in the city right now this is um, I mean we're pulling people from uh, you know different departments to, to head those departments um, but when you're so understaffed citywide and this is not just a city issue you know I own businesses we're, we're paying very competitive wages with good benefits and we are having a very hard time finding people to work in industries that are that are fun you know that people enjoy and and like to be around you um to be in a in a department like this where it's not fun it's very difficult i mean and you're dealing with people's lives it's it's really difficult and so you know i i hear some people uh you know taking shots at the mayor and um it's not as easy as I think people are making it out to be that it's just, you know, well, why don't we just staff up that department? Why don't we just do this? Uh, you know, why? There's a lot that's been going on. This is a unique labor market. People have probably heard the term the great resignation. There's a lot that's going on. And again, I, it's, it's very difficult to, to staff um, any organization, uh, let alone the city, when there are, um, when we aren't able to um, pivot as quickly as the private market is, as we see inflation going, and we're not able to change um, wages as quickly as, as, as the private sector is. And so there's, there's just a lot in there. And, uh, and again, I do want to uh, credit that staff with, um, with, with the staffing levels that they have, being able to find this um, and work it out. Um, you know, I do, I do appreciate them and what they're doing. And, uh, you know, there will be the time when that, when that um, 
department is fully staffed and we will be able to have better controls um, on a lot of these issues. Until then, we have what we have and, and we're making the right decisions. And um, I, I am glad that the mayor and this council are, are making the difficult but right decision to, to move on. And thanks to the Salvation Army for, for stepping up. I appreciate it. All right. Um, Wait, I, Council President, can I go first? Yeah. I'm sure you like the last word. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I just want, also want to reiterate a lot of the thinking, the people that are doing the work, the providers, the people in the shelter every day, uh, that is hard work. And CHHS department, and a lot of stress that they're under. There's people doing a lot of great work. Uh, I'm going to voice the frustrations that a lot of the people in the public and the community have and their concerns and distrust about this process and ongoing operations and processes. Uh, from the very beginning around the Trent building, there's been questions about um, how the building was identified, the involvement of the owner, and why the mayor continues to refuse to put out an offer on purchasing the building to take away the potential profits from the owner of the building. I think there's questions. Uh, there's been questions about the whole RFP process originally that got us to the Guardians, and we've seen red flags throughout this process, uh, such as them not having a 501c3 status, and why weren't these things caught in our process? And so um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm absolutely going to support this and think we're moving in the right direction now. I'm just really concerned about why did we get to this, pot, this spot in the first place and what can we do to assure the public that we will never be in the spot again because I, I, I just don't know if I'm there that I don't think it will happen again. Councilman Ringel. Quick response. Um, on that, I don't know that we can ever assure the public that this will never happen again. Criminal behavior, criminal activity happens, and um, an individual committing criminal acts is something that we can't ever prevent fully. So. Uh, council member's opponent and council member Wilkerson. Yeah, I just want to reiterate, this is, has nothing to do with criminal acts. Sydney Administrator Perkins said this, and the termination of this process, process, or contract has nothing to do with embezzlement. This is other um, inaccurate records, no established systems of internal accounting, and we didn't catch that until now. Councilmember Wilkerson. I will just ask then from the administration, please don't wait 60 days before you come back to us with an update. I would strongly encourage 30. <laughs> oh, guess I would like there. to ask for the vote. I call the vote. <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, I'll defer comment until the contracts so that we can do that. So that's the last comment out there. Uh, prepare to vote. All right, we officially have an emergency for as long as it takes for the administration and Salvation Army to sign the contracts that we have not yet approved yet. So, um, but let's move to that, but uh, before you read um, the titles, uh, is there a motion to add OPR 0784 and 0785 to today's agenda? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? All right, those are added to our consent agenda. If you would go ahead and just read the titles for that. OPR 2022-0784, contract with the Salvation Army to operate the Trent Avenue Homeless Shelter, and OPR 2022-0785, contract with the Salvation Army to operate the Cannon Street Homeless Shelter. All right, Major Perrine, perhaps you'd like to, or maybe Mr. Perkins, if you want to introduce this and introduce him. That'd be yes, sir. Again, Council President, members of the City Council, Johnny Perkins, City Administrator, uh, we are here this afternoon and appreciate this opportunity to present to you a contract with the Salvation Army to become the new operator of both the Trent, also known as the Trent Resource Assistance Center and the Cannon Shelters. As I mentioned previously, it would be as is in terms of the programs and services under the current funding that you all approved for those contracts uh, previously. It would also include the offer of employment to those guardian staff members that are currently there should they uh, wish to maintain employment and also uh, uh, adhere or able to uh, work through the Salvation Army employment uh, criteria. If they meet those, then they will be offered, offered, offered jobs. I want to thank the Guardians for their tremendous support. I want to thank them for their tremendous work 
Uh, they did step up in a number of instances when the city needed them to do that, irrespective of this act we're taking today and took a f yesterday. And so I want to just thank them for that uh, effort and for that support. But I'm also proud to introduce the Salvation Army, having partnered with them not only here but in San Diego. I can speak to the integrity of their organization, to the character of uh, their staff and, and their leadership, and I'm proud today to have uh, them uh, a step away from your approval to be partners with us at uh, the Trent and Cannon Shelters. So with that, I will, uh, one last thing, we really do need more than a 30-day assessment, Council Member Wilkerson, but I'm gonna let Major Perrine uh, address that when he, when he comes up. So it's my pleasure to introduce Major Ken Perrine of the Salvation Army to highlight a little bit about what their thoughts are as they take over the operations of both Trent and Cannon. Council President and City Council, again, we just want to thank you, the Salvation Army, that uh, for considering us again. Uh, you know, we've been in this, uh, we've been here for 132 years next year, and uh, we've done a lot of projects with the city, and we've helped a lot of people move forward out of homelessness and, and back into regular society, which is always what the Salvation Army is mm -hmm. about. We're, we're not really in, in the business of housing people for the sake of housing them. We want to work with them to help them move forward, and that's what the way out has demonstrated, and so I hope... I thank you that you consider us for this particular contract and know that our goals are still the same, is to help people move forward. Uh, if they have addiction issues, we deal with that. If they have just regular life issues, we deal with that. So again, thank you for that. It is our intention to take over the track and cannon uh, contracts, as is the way they are right now. We do want to spend a little bit of time to look at how they were doing things and if that fits within the Salvation Army uh, methods and uh, methodology for this type of work. Also for the uh, staff, it is our intention to hire uh, as many of the staff that fit within our, our, our staffing model uh, and our staffing uh, costs. Um, so I want to say that. And then I do have um, some folks from our divisional headquarters, if you can stand up. So I, we brought folks from our finance department and our HR team. Thank you. You can mm -hmm. pull that down. <laughs> but uh, they're here, and the reason they're here is to help us really um, – put together the plan so we can quickly get things going. Uh, I did talk to uh, the Guardian's director yesterday, Mike, and we talked twice um, and just to kind of work stuff out a little bit. And as soon as, uh, should we get the contracts, uh, we'll be heading on over there to uh, sit down with their HR staff and them to work out the plan for the next couple days. It is our intention to try to meet with all the staff tomorrow, if possible. That's a, you know, knock on wood. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we do that and kind of explain uh, the, the process for the whole, how this is all going to work out. It is our plan to keep operations the same initially and to, and to only correct the things that, uh, that we have to correct initially. Um, it is our intention to still be doing the outreach that we're currently doing from the way out. So we might expand a little bit because they, they have other employees that are currently involved in that. The Cannon Street... Uh, Shelter, it's our, again, our intention to continue to operate that uh, the way it is right now and then do it, evaluate it as we go to see uh, the parts that need to be, um, to be rectified. Uh, our, the way we do finances here, just in case you're wondering, uh, you know, we, as you know, the way we do it, we, we direct bill for service. So that's, that's how we've always done it. Um, we have an admin fee that we have to pay, so we put that on top of that, but there's no extra fees in the way we do stuff. We, what we tell you is what we tell you, and our goal always is to uh, provide the best uh, benefit for the city. And I think our, our past contracts easily demonstrate that. So I want to thank you again for that. Uh, I think that's what I got. Unless you have questions, I'm probably missing I'll see something. I people have questions, but yeah. thanks for being here, Major. Uh, Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, uh, Major, thank you for being here. I, one, one thing I was just maybe asked for is, as you're doing your analysis of the facilities and whatnot, um, you know, the, the, the previous provider had mentioned to me, and I... I I agree that the the cannon shelter is just highly inefficient the way it's currently laid out um and so i would certainly appreciate any sort of assessments on the future of that facility changes either with re remodeling or or changing facilities mm -hmm. um just to, to provide the best you know mo uh, bang for the buck for the taxpayers and, and to provide the best service possible um, so I would just, any recommendations, feedback that you might accumulate as you're doing your analysis to bring back would be um, very um, um, uh, grateful for. So thank you. A absolutely. That's part of our plan is to be looking at each site uh, and how to mm -hmm. provide the best service for the folks, our guests that we have mm -hmm. coming in. Uh, we want, again, folks to be moving forward uh, out of their situation. 
uh, so that we can get more productive citizens in Spokane mm -hmm. and uh, be part. There's always victory. I'm always talking about victory. Mm -hmm. You know, people are always just a few steps from getting back on their feet and moving forward, and that's what we want to be able to do with people. So absolutely, we can definitely do that. Other questions for the major? Councilmember Wilkerson. Mr. Perkins, I did not want a total assessment, but I would like to know in 30 days how many people are there? What's your staffing levels like? Oh. What, what was your first challenges in the first couple of weeks? Uh, just to give us an idea. Otherwise, as a council, after 60 days, we'd be coming in pretty blind yeah. uh, as to really what's going on. We, Although we can easily do that. That, that, was, that was my request. So yeah. thank you and, very and much I, for that. Actually, uh, we might, if you, you guys are so busy. And I know mm -hmm. some of you have other jobs and other businesses mm -hmm. and stuff, but but maybe we can invite you out so you can mm -hmm. see and we can have a kind of one-on-one -on -one walkthrough as some of you did for the way out. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I just want to push the way out. If you want to be blessed, come for dinner at the way out. Uh, that's my open invitation anytime mm -hmm. you like. And uh, just really see people's lives who have been changed. Um, or lunch, they tell me. Or, or lunch. lunch. I'm yeah. having lunch tomorrow there. <clears throat> oh, there you go. Your staff has won me over. Yes. They are doing great work and yeah. it's been great to get to know them and to see them in the community and working with our neighborhood councils. Yeah. Um, it makes a big difference in a neighborhood when you have those kind of facilities that, that those relationships are mm -hmm. created. So yeah. I appreciate that. And I'm not sure if you even know, I know we're talking about something else, but we'll go back to way out just for a second. But they actually, we, we don't always dress them up in the Salvation Army vest, so they're supposed to be wearing it so they don't get run over. But mm -hmm. we actually have them walking in the neighborhood picking up trash and cleaning up messes for the other people left behind. So, but that's part of that, you know, we have Rescue the Perishing, Renew the Ability to Thrive, and Restore Healthy Community. That's the whole idea of being part of the community. That you, right now you're living with us, but you're really living part of the community of Spokane. And that's what we really want to be implementing at all, all the sites that we have. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Any other questions for the major? All right. Well, know that we wish you and your staff very well. Thank you again for coming down as always. And yes, uh, major is come before for six o'clock reports on that. So I'm <laughs> imagining we'll have them a little more frequently in the next yes. uh, while. Um, so now we have uh, some community comment, um, Catherine Cork and Barry Barfield, and uh, I'm going to start with you, Barry, this time first, uh, and then I'll have Catherine come up. <laughs> oh, I am Barry Barfield. I serve as the administrator of the Spokane Homeless Coalition, and um, Council President, I know I address you, yeah. but my comments might go beyond you. Um, I know we're talking about, and I, I'm sure it will be a, a seamless transition as possible. I have great confidence in the Salvation Army. The folks that are part of the Spokane Homeless Coalition is about 1,400 people on our listserv. And as I think you're all aware, there's a lot going on homeless-wise in the media. And our members, uh, the, most of our members are in the trenches, boots on the ground, helping people. In, agencies all over the county. So they, many of them rely on our listserv for information. I am hoping that uh, I can work, I, I, I sort of run the listserv. I'm hoping that I, uh, the Salvation Army will be very forthcoming uh, about putting out information. Like the fact that it's going to be the same, nothing's gonna change. I know there will be a great deal of confusion out there among the providers among the folks, the homeless folks who hear like, oh, the guardians are gone. I mean, there's going to be a lot of uh, people just confused. Are they closing? Is it open? Different pe so I'm just hoping that uh, at least through my uh, services and any others that can, that can actually get it out to the folks who are dealing daily with homeless people and trying to refer them, that, that it will be as seamless as possible. That's my hope. All right. Thank you. All right. Catherine. Hello again. I'm Catherine Corrick. I'm a community volunteer for the city, in the city. Um, I work with various agencies, including the city, uh, on the point in time count. And, um, and I'm an advocate for mostly on issues related to homelessness, probably um, more than you would like to hear. But I want to congratulate on the Salvation Army on being chosen to run this, both of these shelters. Um, 
primarily because they're an agency of unquestioned integrity. And I think we really need to have that in our corner right now. Um, they also have a culture of high performance and of support for individual needs. And I think that um, all of us that are concerned with homelessness, and I am a member of the um, Homeless Coalition as well, um, really want to see people met where they are. And that's really an important piece of how people go forward without um, relapsing into homelessness again. We don't want to get people out the door and then back in the door two months later because they didn't have the skills that they needed. Um, even though we're not talking about Camp Hope, I would like to bring out that there is a lot of innovation going on there in terms of services provided and collaboration. And I would um, just ask the major um, to take a look at what can be useful that they are doing there um, at TRAC and perhaps um, uh, figure out ways that um, um, a seamless transition from people at Camp Hope to um, the TRAC Center, if that's their desire, can happen. Um, many people that uh, completed the survey in July said that they would consider track depending on operator, okay? I think this is a real positive step forward and some of the people maybe that weren't interested before might be interested now, um, especially as they get forward and decide on where they're going. So that's my thought. Um, the other concern that I have is um, we've always been hearing talk about 250 beds. Um, I'm interested in knowing when we're gonna get to that level and then lately there's been a lot of talk of expanding up to 400 beds. And to me, that sounds like a warehouse again, um, other than very short term. So um, I would really be interested in what Mr. Perrine, um, Major Perrine has to say about that. And is it realistic to run um, track with 400 people mm -hmm. plus all the navigators and all that kind of stuff there? Um, and hopefully um, consideration would be given to utilizing some of the very high caliber um, providers that are actually providing on-site services okay. there. That's red. Okay, yep. goodbye. Right. You'll hear from me again. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much for coming down. Uh, any council commentary? All right, well, I'll get my last comment in. <laughs> Councilmember Kinnear. Interrupted. Interrupted. Um, I just, uh, there's a, a, several things that I wanted to say, but one, I just wanted to um, give my appreciation for uh, City Administrator Perkins and uh, London Smithson working closely in this. This is a really tough situation, the terminated contract in the middle of it. It's very sensitive, um, it's hard, and you, there's a lot of moving parts, and you have to be careful about announcing it or not, and when that, it's just challenging, but I felt like in the last, 36 hours we worked closely together um, and I pre appreciated that uh, just just for the CHHS and the legal team to come up with the contract was mm -hmm. almost overwhelming to them and they had to go through several versions and and people had to work hard that so that's not even doing the operations that's just the paperwork so um, that was really challenging and I thought people uh, met the mark on that as best they could under challenging circumstances. So I wanted to thank people for that. Um, I also wanted to expand a little bit um, on Council Member Zappone's comments about uh, the people who are in the trenches actually doing the work. Uh, there are so many hundreds of people who are uh, being paid and devoting their professional careers to helping people who are without homes and have uh, huge challenges and through no fault of their own and find themselves in one of the toughest situations that we can imagine in their lives and there are just every day people doing that uh, and a lot of people volunteering uh, there are churches involved and community groups and people care deeply in this community and I just want to take this moment to shine a spotlight on that and I want to shine a special spotlight on the people who have been working at the Trent and the Cannon Shelters. And they probably don't care too much 
who the boss is and who's right, they're just serving those people. And I'm sure in the last few weeks of them being in the news uh, involuntarily and in the last few hours wondering what their professional lives look like, that they're distressed and anxious, and uh, we all would be. So I just want to uh, say how much we appreciate the work that you do and that as you heard today, uh, we're doing everything we can to make it as seamless and you can continue to do your work and serve people uh, with your gifts. And the last thing I wanna just say is that um, this is not, this contract is just the as is. It is not dealing with setting up a second navigation center to uh, decommission Camp Hope uh, residents into permanent housing. Uh, if that proposal were to come forward, it hasn't really been shared with council, certainly not as a whole. If that were, it'll, it'll come back and not. So we're continuing the Trent Shelter that we all envisioned. And if there's uh, some desire to have a second navigation center in addition to the one that's at Second and Ray right now, uh, you know, we'll listen to that. But that is, this is not changing that. And we're gonna continue the course of reducing the people who live um, at what's often called Camp Hope and getting them into housing. And after, you know, seven or eight months of government refusing to do anything and expecting some other government to do it, no matter where you are, and the city will have to take its share of responsibility for that, we are now working together and we're all, every, every eye is focused on helping um, the group of people there transition and it's working. People are getting into housing, they're going to treatment and uh, it will just continue to accelerate and I'm pleased to do that. I do hope that there will be less rancor and threatens, threats and lawsuits and that we could just focus on doing the work. We, uh, you know, the mayor and I, we actually agree on most things, uh, but on homelessness, we've sometimes felt differently. But this summer we came together with our staffs and we met with um, County and Spokane Valley and we came up with a proposal to rehouse the people at Camp Hope and we signed our names to it and gave it over to Commerce and said, please start implementing this and they have and they are. And if we hadn't waited six or seven months and I'm including myself collectively to be able to figure out how to work together that way, it would already be taken care of, uh, but it's gonna take a little bit longer. So I appreciate everyone's involved and I'm, I'm really glad the entire community is focused on this because each person that is without a home and suffering right now uh, deserves to be part of Spokane so that we all belong. And with that, if you're in favor of the consent agenda as written, uh, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? All right. That is approved, and I don't think there's any other business there, so I will uh, adjourn us. Everyone, please have a good rest of the week and weekend. We'll see you not on Monday night because we're taking it off, but we'll be back November 7th. We're adjourned. Happy Halloween. Trick or treat. <laughs>